All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the virtual Disciple Making Forum. We are so glad you have joined us this morning, and uh, we've got a We've got a great session lined up this morning, so we're thankful you're here. If you were here yesterday, you you heard from two incredible leaders, uh, and you're going to hear from another one today. So we heard from Daniel M. and Ken Adams yesterday in two different sessions, and now we're going to hear from Scott Kendig in just a minute. I'll let Andrew introduce him. My name is Mark Ganey. I'm the lead pastor at Fultondale First Baptist, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving on the Disciple Making Lead Team at the state of Alabama, and Daniel Edmonds leads that group, and Andy Frazier and Robert Mullins and I. Uh, help him with that. And so we've kind of, um, we've been blessed and, and privileged to be able to, to gather the people who would have been here in person uh, at my church right now at Fultondale First Baptist for uh, the Deci State Discipleship Conference. We'll uh, tell you a little bit more about when that's going to meet in a bit uh, at the end of our session today. But instead of meeting in person, we're gathering virtually. And so we're thankful that they agreed to do that. And, uh, and so I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to hand it over to Andy. Uh, who will introduce Scott. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, another opportunity to hear from a leader in disciple making. And Father, thank you for those who have gathered here. Thank you for their interest and passion for fulfilling the Great Commission, the mandate you've given us. And so, Father, I pray that uh, for the next few minutes, God, we'd be able to eliminate distractions and focus on what uh, you would have us to hear and uh, what you would have us to learn and, and put uh, in practice in our churches and in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Andy, take it away. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Mark, thank you for opening our time together today. And wow, what a great day we had yesterday with Daniel M. and Ken Adams. Uh, they shared some things that were very, very helpful, insightful, encouraging, and even challenging. And I know this morning is going to be the same. We're, we're thankful for Scott Kendig, who is joining us all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Scott serves as the executive pastor for Kingdom Initiatives there at Community Bible Church in San Antonio. Uh, Scott is a disciple maker. I don't know of any other way to describe him, uh, mainly because he has been discipled. He loves to make disciples. Uh, some people invested in him early on in his uh, his his walk with Christ, and that's just kind of stuck with him. Uh, he loves the idea of being uh, in, in continually investing in the lives of others. He loves multiplying. He loves being a part of, of the, the genesis of movements of disciple making. So uh, the Lord has actually influenced a lot of what we're doing here in the state of Alabama through Scott's ministry and, and Scott's friendship and partnership. Uh, you can talk to uh, Robert Mullins or Larry Heitch or, or Brandon Fomby about that. They they were discipled by Scott. So, Scott, we're so thankful that you could join us today. Let me encourage all of you who are with us as we go along, use the chat function to just kind of communicate with each other. Uh, you can even comment on what's happening there. But if you want to ask Scott a question, use the Q&A. We'll be glad to bring your questions up and try to get Scott to to answer those at the end of his time. Uh, so make sure also, as you get ready to do this, that you get a pen and paper handy. Uh, you're going to want to take notes with what Scott has to say today. So Scott, we're so thankful that you could join us and we really appreciate the time you've given us here this morning. Now I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Scott Kendi. I'm excited about the, the time that we, uh, that we have together. And, uh, I want to dive in just as quick as we can and, uh, and my, my two goals basically for, um, for today has been, um, can we look at how, how Jesus multiplied and can we imitate that? Um, so if we can look at how Jesus did things and then we can copy what we do from his model and the ways that he made disciples, we're going to be significantly further down the road if we follow the model of the master disciple maker. Um, so there's a couple things I want to, I want to show you. And, uh, in the chat bar, feel free to, to put questions in there and, and feel free to make comments and we can pick up those things as we go through our time together. But what I want to show you is that God from the very beginning in Genesis had this, this idea that, he was going to create the world and that we were going to inhabit the world and we were going to represent him well everywhere that we go. And he, uh, he gave us the, the, the really divine mandate for us to be fruitful and multiply. 
And so I want to show you just a little way to look at multiplication that might be a little different than what we got in our uh, third grade multiplication table reality. And so what we're going to look at is a model that shows that there's, there's fruitfulness in relationship with Jesus. And uh, the way that we're going to support that is these three overlapping circles give us five different opportunities to look at how we approach ministry. This relates to disciple making, but it also relates to leadership development and multiplication. It also relates to church planting. And so um, one of the things we want to do is we want to, to look at these overlapping circles and we want to consider how we can be fruitful and multiply. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to call uh, level one uh, subtracting. That's a subtracting reality. Uh, level three is addition. And level five is multiplication. So what we have is subtraction, addition, and multiplication. We're going to do a couple quick, really fun things here that you're going to like a whole lot. Um, so if you look at addition, one plus one equals, okay, you can put them up on your hands, you know, two, all right, that's right. Uh, but one times one equals one. So for a season, addition gives us better results than multiplication. But if you carry that out a couple of generations, two plus two equals four, but two times two equals four. So now in one generation of multiplication, uh, we've caught up with the advantages of addition and then we get exponential past that because when you get to three plus three, that equals six, but when you get to three times three, that equals nine. So what, what Jesus is, is trying to utilize our life for is that we could be an exponential. If you keep going down here, the, the results of multiplication beat the results of addition every time. And so what we want to do is we want to look at what is, what is going on in, in these different levels of multiplication as we make disciples. So, um, so first, what we want to say is there's a mantra. So there's a mantra for level one, and that mantra is please stay. Okay, so this is the comment that middle school boy who's 14 years old has a, a, a middle school girl who's 14 years old, and she wants to break up with the 14-year-old guy. And so what this guy says is, Hey, let's please stay. If this is happening in a discipling relationship, is this, if this is happening in a church planning relationship, you know what it's like right when you begin something new. What you need is people who will just stay. And God is with us inside the reality of subtraction. We don't have much money. We don't have much resource. Our worship leader plays uh, a kazoo. And uh, we, we, we don't really know what we're doing yet. We're forming as a community. Um, so level two is not quite yet to addition. So it's somewhere between subtraction and addition. And the reality here is, is what we're trying to do at level two is just survival. We want to survive. We want to keep moving forward in our discipling relationships. We want to keep moving forward in our uh, direction if we're a church plant or a, a, a missional group or a community group we want to multiply so at the level of addition the mantra that we have moves from please stay to please come and and what's happening over here is we're not doing very well because we're new at this at level two we're kind of figuring this out. We feel like we can pay our bills. We feel like we can survive. At level three, the only way we could get better now is if we get more people to come. But if we're just getting more people to come, that's a mark of addition. And Jesus in, in Genesis 1, and, and then right after the flood, he came right back in Genesis, and he, he reinforced twice that 
My goal is to multiply you. So what we have between addition and multiplication is this reality of, hey, we, we can begin to reproduce. So what's happening up to this point is we're getting, we're getting the stuff in us from Jesus that helps us move from addition, uh, from subtraction to addition, and then suddenly we start making disciples and we're beginning to reproduce. Now, uh, you guys may not have the, the pleasure of this yet, but uh, I happen to have the pleasure of all the men or ladies that are on the call of having a grandbaby. Now, uh, I love my kids, but every, every day, somewhere between three and five o'clock, we get a phone call from my grandbaby, Georgia, who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, she has figured out at 20 months old how to get an iPhone, how to put it on uh, a FaceTime, and how to get Graham on the phone. And she loves talking to Graham, but the, the fun of the game is, <laughs> is when Graham goes to find G-Daddy. That's what I'm called. I'm G-Daddy. But I'll, I'll answer whatever Georgia calls me. And, uh, and so just as soon as Kim comes around the corner and sees my face, the, just the most beautiful, wonderful thing happens. Uh, She'll go, gee, daddy, gee, daddy. And it's just the most exciting thing uh, in my life, especially in COVID, 27 days in, in sheltering in place. That reality for me is, is, a, is a big deal. I, I reproduced my kids, you know, so, so that is not, that's not really uh, multiplication. So what happened is Kim and I have four kids. There's two, there's two of us, and now there's four kids, Seth, Nate, Drew, and Mary. And uh, thank God they all got their DNA from their mothers, so they're really smart. Uh, but the, the challenge and the reality that, that we have is when do we multiply? It's, it's when your babies start having babies. And so when we move to multiplication, the reality is I have, I have made disciples of people who are making disciples of people. And, and if we do this right, if we do this the, the Jesus kind of pattern, what we begin to see is we see, begin to see generations of disciples start coming out from under generations of disciples. When, when Robert and I began talking about these concepts and he started gathering people around him locally, um, he, he invested in the people that were closest to him. And now there's several generations of disciples that come from the Robert Mullins tree of disciple making because we moved from subtraction to survival through addition into reproduction so that we could finally have babies who were making babies who were making babies discipleship wise. And, um, uh, Disciple making is, is so significant to Jesus that what happens is you can probably intuitively pick this up, but you move from please stay and subtraction to please come because we're doing a pretty good job now. We can, we can probably hang out and do some good stuff together um, here at this level. But the only way this gets better is if, we, if more people come, which is the mantra of, of the church. Let's measure the number of people in seats, that's number, uh, let's, let's measure the offering, let's measure the baptisms. But when you get to multiplication, you, for the first time, you have the opportunity not just to please stay, not just to please come, but all of a sudden, you have the opportunity to send, to send people, to go make disciples. And when you invest in people over a long period of time, which Jesus had 12 guys for three years, and he spent more than 50% of his time with those 12 guys for three years. Those of you that have heard me, you've heard me say that God's formula for and strategy for uh, bringing peace to the Middle East was that he made disciples. Um, his strategy for making peace in the toughest parts of the toughest cities was he spent three years with 12 disciples. 50% of his time, if you walk, follow him around the Gospels, was, was given 
to him being with the 12 or with parts of the 12, the three and the one. And so, so Jesus showed us not only can we be fruitful and multiply, but can we be fruitful and multiply so that we become a blessing to all nations? You know, from San Antonio, could we do something here in this city that would spread to all nations? And, and as we gather the people who are close to us, like Robert did, like Andy's doing, like Mark does, like the discipleship uh, department uh, is, is pressing forward in Alabama, this whole idea of, of multiplication, that disciple making was Jesus' primary ministry strategy to continue his ministry on planet Earth once he ascended. And I want you to know, it was so effective that they, that, the, the believers, who there were about 120 in an upper room, were scared to death until Pentecost. And then when the Holy Spirit, who Jesus promised to send them, um, came alive inside of them, they didn't have, watch this, they, they, they didn't have a, a formed Bible. They, they didn't have um, a, a building. They didn't have great programs and incredible curriculum. What they had was this process of disciple making in homes that, that supplemented what was being done at the temple in the early days and then in the gatherings in, in later days. And so what happens is we can put 80, 90, 95% of all of our attention into our programming, our curriculum, our buildings, and having the best personalities and having the best worship leaders with the greatest hair gel and the best skinny jeans with holes in them that you could possibly ever find with smoke and mirrors and fog and all that sort of stuff. But what happened with those 120 people who, once they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out and find their people and sit at tables in their home and make disciples, they went from in, 33-ish A.D. to 365 A.D., having half of the planet captured for Christianity through disciple-making. And that process of making disciples can be replicated anywhere. It's the only scalable, reproducible, sustainable, and multipliable thing that every believer can do. And Ken talked about that yesterday when he was with you. He talked about the primacy of Jesus' final words, go make disciples of all nations. Well, how do we do that? We start where we are, and then we slowly allow uh, the process of Jesus to invest six months, maybe nine months, maybe, maybe really in different levels over the course of two years, like you're teaching them to do all the things that you've done. And as they go do it, you spend time with them. So, so our, our strategy, if it looked a little more like Jesus, now I know we can't walk around with 12 people, uh, but we can take the people who are closest to us and we can help them see that Man, when you take this down to 10 times 10, that's 100 people. When 10 plus 10 is 20 people, God wants to use your life where when you see Jesus' face, <laughs> when everything is settled and you hear, I will see his face. And when you see his face, He's going to tell you, if you're a disciple maker, a multiplying disciple maker, he's going to tell you to turn around and look, and you're going to see the sea of people who multiplied past you that you'll never get any credit for on earth because nobody has a tracking system good enough to track what multiplication is going to look like. Nobody can, I mean, LifeWay can give it a shot, but they're probably not going to get it past the fourth generation because you can't keep up with people to the fourth generation. I just want to tell you just a couple things. There are pockets uh, around the country of places where the guys that are, that are leading discipleship in Alabama have invested. In the Northwest, there's a set of churches that when they began to live life together and when they began to multiply and when they began to use uh, Jesus' methods 
that uh, a church system of two and a half churches that were doing pretty well has turned into over the span of six years because of leadership development through disciple making that they've they planted 16 churches in the span of just a handful of years because they have enough leaders that they can send that's that what jesus was doing with the 12 he, yes he amazed the crowds yes he spoke as one who had authority he delivered people who had demons and and he healed people who had diseases he did amazing things but there's nothing quite as amazing when you measure it as what happened when his disciples full of the holy spirit went to do with other people what jesus had done with them and so here's the goal the goal is if if you're in a disciple making process already um, be the leader who other people would want to imitate you we want to have a life worthy of imitation so we can't be the people who are worn out torn down beat up uh angry <laughs> bitter upset over whatever the the government's doing or over whatever's happening in my church the reality is at the disciple making level you can multiply and you can have when you see jesus face that turnaround moment where you see literally myriads of people now um one of the things that I want to do, I want to add to this real quick, and then we'll, we'll kind of move to another thing. One of the things that we're discovering now is if you were to, if you were to take these three issues in discipleship, um, the way we do discipleship now in most churches is based on your IQ. We want to teach you in classes and and that is a form of discipleship. We want to teach you in classes, but much of the teaching about discipleship is, is really about your IQ. Your IQ is your intelligent quotient. And I know everybody in Alabama like has like 200 or 300 more points in their IQ than anyone else has in the state. Believe me, I'm, I'm from Georgia and I'm from Texas. So I know how smart people in Alabama are. And, uh, and so the IQ is high there. So this works in lots of places in Alabama and Texas and Georgia doesn't work quite as well. You know, we have to like really work hard to, to help our IQs, you know, be able to help, help other people. But the reality that we have is IQ alone only gives us the information about Jesus. And so we can do information transfer really, really well. Uh, if we teach, 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 but Jesus took teaching to a whole nother level that's called training. So he apprenticed people with him. Come with me while I go over here. And anywhere you went with Jesus, you were going to figure out something that you had never seen before. <laughs> Stuff that you'd never imagined. The, the kind of healings, the kind of comments that he made, the kind of um, the way he dealt with difficulties. So, they were not just learning from him, they were becoming like him. And, and there's a reality that there's more than IQ in discipleship. There's also EQ. This is your emotional intelligence. And your emotional intelligence lets you realize a moment when God's breaking through and great things are happening because of that moment. And you can see what's happening in people and you can see when there's a breakthrough because here's the reality. What Jesus did by giving us the word of God and by teaching us and having all the record is he gave us the best truth in the history of the world. We have the best truth. We have it. But sometimes we miss the needs of people and our empathy level is, is inexact because we're not necessarily sitting across tables from people at the level that we should be because it's easier to herd them into a space and to do IQ than it is to actually know them and for them to know you and for them to love you. And, and listen to me. I mean, really listen to this. The emotional reality of being a pastor and being a leader is a heavy weight. It can, it can pull you down into all the negative things that are taking place, things people might say, uh, slander, gossip in the church, all that kind of stuff is going on. 
And so we have to be emotionally healthy so that the best truth can actually get to the right places in our heart. And the way that works is, is it, it's perfect just like this. God breaks into you. There's an inbreaking of the kingdom of God that takes place when he teaches you something or when another brother or sister sits down with you and leads you through something and you can see like the impact and the emotion that that brings. And that moment is the moment we have to pay attention to so that the break in actually gets to break through. And break through is taking what your break in does and I want it to be something that impacts my life. So really what disciple making is, is integrating the good news into a lifestyle. That's what we're aiming for. We want to integrate the good news of Jesus into a lifestyle. Everything you find in the Bible is good news. As a matter of fact, when bad stuff happens to you, God, according to Romans 8, 28, turns that into good and, and he helps you. And so even when something bad comes, look for the bow on the package because God wants to deliver that bow. So, so it breaks in so that it can break through so that you can see a break out around you. And, and Jesus had breakouts all the time. His breakouts were amazing. Thousands of people fed, 12 baskets of food left over so that the 12 disciples could see, wait a minute, hey, we started out with just loaves and fishes, and now all of a sudden, all of us got a basket full of this stuff? Jesus, you're going to have to explain this to us. And Jesus took the break in and made it a breakthrough, and then there was a break out. That's, that's the way emotional intelligence meets us in discipleship. We can't just be full of knowledge. We actually have to be full of emotional empathy. Now, here's, here's the last one, and then we'll, we'll kind of put a bow on this package. This is LQ. LQ. So LQ, LQ is, your, is your love and intelligence. Now, here's, here's what we know. They'll know that we're his disciples by how we love one another. Now listen, we're called actually to love everybody. We're called to love people who hate Jesus. <laughs> we're called to love people who um, have different political parties than we are. We're called to love people who have issues in life that have never been resolved because of the way that they grew up um, or that they were born in a specific place that didn't have much access to the gospel. And, and so our love quotient works like this. Um, we, we take the information of God and we actually care for people with it. And when we care for people that we're discipling, then we go on mission because the love quotient is we can't just collect knowledge in our heads without going with our hearts into the mission field. So you are a missionary force going to a missionary field. And when we have a force field at work like that, we have intelligent, you have your IQ, you have your EQ, you have your love quotient. We are moving forward on mission because we're not making disciples if we're not going on mission. We're not making disciples if our disciples don't make disciples. And so what we have to do is create a scalable, sustainable, reproducible, multipliable way for you to take what has been poured into you and for that to spill over into everybody around you. Now, real quick, like what I'd love to, what I'd love to see on the, on the call and in the chat for just a minute is how many of you have actually had someone who took a season of time, uh, six months, nine months, a year, um, and, and they intentionally, intentionally poured into you. And all the capital that somebody had put into them, they put into you. Now, you can use the reaction uh, mode there. You can clap. You can, you can raise your hand. You can, uh, you can get on the screen. You can do this deal. Yes, I had that. Um, our, our goal would be that, that everybody that's a believer actually has a season like that. So that that season becomes the break in so that a, a, a believer who's been walking a little bit longer in disciple making 
can help you get the most out of your breakthroughs so that they can then send you to be a person of breakout. Now, um, this past week, I got a, I got a real sweet, real sweet little note from somebody. And I know I'm talking a lot, but we're going to have questions and answer in just a minute. And so somebody, somebody did this for me and said, okay, so here's, here's Scott. At the time I was living in Atlanta and here's this guy named Drew and he's living in Washington state. And, and for a period of two years, um, discipled Drew and spent time with him. And then he discipled his brother, Kyle, who's also in Washington state. And then several other leaders alongside him. And, and, and Drew discipled this other person named Jane, who he married. And Kyle discipled this other person named Sarah, who he married. So I'm not saying that disciple making is a meat market here, that you can just get married, you know, just start discipling people and you can find your spouse. But in reality, that is what happened for me in the discipleship group I started in. Um, and it is what happened for Drew and it is what happened for Kyle. But now they're in their 11th and 12th generation of discipling people who you wouldn't know their names and, and it wouldn't matter if you did. And there's been at least from what was a two year, I'm going to take care of this brother as much as I can in a disciple making way so that he can do everything he can possibly do. And that church system that went from two and a half churches to 16 churches in the span of just less than a decade um, triggered off of disciple making. And then over here, what we're seeing is four and five generations of people who are three generations down from me. And so the reality that we have here is if, if you take one on eight, you have nine at the end of the year, but if those eight take on six at the end of that, that's 48 more and you're taking on a new eight. And then if the 48 take on four, if they take on four, then that's a 192 people. And you're looking at, if your investment is six months or nine months, you're looking at within three years influencing 249 people by spending time with them in a, a cluster of people who can do life together with a leader that's not perfect, but it's imitatable. And, and our goal is to help as many people as possible have a reality like that. You can still have gatherings at church and do all of the things that you do at church. It's a great swimming pool for the people that you'll find that you can disciple. And then the people that you disciple become leaders. And all of a sudden, over the span of just a couple years, in, uh, in, in a couple of the places that we've been, we've seen six and seven turnover multiplying into leaders who have the same vocabulary in the same DNA and the 12 had Jesus DNA so much that without Jesus being present on the planet anymore they went from 120 people scared to death in an upper room to 20 what 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 Rodney Stark says is 20 million people at a time where the planet of the earth had 40 million people in it this is not just uh, selling a, a better mousetrap this is a reality of how much can we get as much as possible like Jesus in the way that we make disciples that sit at our tables a little more frequently and that we talk about what is the break in that breaks through so that we can break out. So, so Andy, I'm going to slow down here and, uh, and, and turn this over to you to help us facilitate some of the Q and A time. And that may run into more drawing on boards or whatever, but you, you guys can leave me here. I'm going to grab a drink of water and, and uh, let you guys get us started on that. Yes, yeah, Scott, thank you so much for uh, leading us. I, I mentioned in the chat that this is more like uh, drinking from a fire hydrant than it is sipping gently from a water fountain. So you so sorry a lot about of that. <laughs> but no, and that's a good thing. So I know you guys, as you have listened to Scott, are probably in your head formulating some questions that you're thinking about. Don't don't be shy. Ask. So go ahead and submit those questions in the Q and A, and we'll try to walk through those and answer those the best we can. 
Scott, a couple of questions we have to start with are, it's, it's being asked that uh, someone in their current experience seems to kind of get locked out at stage three, that uh, the, just the addition stage, the please come stage. Do you see movement to four and five as more organic or a loving push of encouragement? So I, I, I don't want to try to assume details in that question, but I'm, I'm guessing you see what they're talking about there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll put this back up real quick. I want to show you a couple things to answer, to try to answer that question just a little bit. So there's, there's some resistors in everything that, that, that we do. And so if you look at this mark at level two, it represents kind of a force field, a magnetic force field, because everybody that's at one wants to end up at two or three because it's just better. You can pay your bills. That's a nice thing. Um, and, and there's a second force field that takes place right here at level four. And here's, here's what happens is as you move. And so let me just give you some stats real quick. As you move from 80% of churches in America are in level one. And that means the way they categorize this is there a hundred or less and declining. So 80% of churches are here. Um, for a, a long time, 16% of churches were here, but over the last you know, four or five years, this is an exponential format from Todd Wilson. You can actually go on exponential.org and you can download a book about, about this right here if you want more information. But it used to be 16% here and now it's 13% of churches are a hundred plus, and this is all goes a hundred plus all the way to mega church level three in, in addition. And so, um, this used to be 4%, uh, but now there are 7% of churches in America that are in reproduction. That means like they are, they're multiplying services. They're, they're multi-siding. They're figuring out ways to have multiple. I mean, just, just they're figuring out ways to, to fix space problems. And then they realize these space problems keep coming. So what we've got to do is we've got to start sending some people to be a church somewhere. So, so the reality is the second force field comes this direction. And by the way, if you guys want to get on a call a later with more depth than this, we can certainly do it. But this mirrors the, the journey from um, being slaves in Egypt to crossing the Red Sea to the wilderness to the prom, uh, to to the uh, Jordan River and then to the Promised Land. And so what happens here is forces try to keep you when you start getting to three, three and a half, and four uh, that area. What happens is all the forces that that can be conjured up by the enemy try to push us back this direction. So what happens when you move from layer to layer is from here to here, you just, you can pay your bills from here to here. You're doing what your original vision was intended to do. But if it stays in addition world, like we just need a few more rears and seats this week than we had last week. We need a few more dollars in the bank account than we had last week. We, we have more baptisms. Then we're staying, we're staying in the operating system of addition. And so what we have to do is start making decisions differently. And I'll show you how easy, is, easy this is. The operating system in level one is we can't. Our only hope of success is if God can. <laughs> so God comes in and he does miracles. So the operating system is actually what defines what level you're in. You might look like you're in a level three, but actually be thinking with an operating system of we can't. That's a, a sort of a poverty mindset in church. God, God has all the resources that you need. The operating system in level three is we can and you can help. What that means is us paid professionals who have degrees, we, we can take care of things if you guys just show up and you pay your tithe and you pay the tax and you pray for the missionaries. That's all we need you to do. The operating system 
that moves from, you know, the mantra is please stay, please come, please go. The operating system is we can't, we can, you can help. And this is probably intuitive again. Now it's you can, why? Because we've discipled you and we can help. Then staff becomes the people who are equipping the saints for the works of service that God's prepared for them to do. So you move on this by the operating system that you embrace. And so when you start making decisions like, you know what, our people are competent, they can do some of the stuff that we're killing ourselves trying to do. When, when you start thinking that way, you're really close to sending and multiplying. So uh, it is organic. But what we've discovered is you don't move this way as church planning reality unless you move this way disciple making reality. So disciple making reality precedes groups multiplying and it precedes churches planting. That leads right into a combination of several questions we're having that kind of have the same theme. Um, it's kind of being asked, all right, how do you, do you maintain this, this fidelity and this sense of mission in re reproducing and multiplying? How do you maintain that as you go in those that you disciple? I mean, not just trying to have a small group Bible study or a closed group Bible fellowship or whatever. How do you maintain that drive and that passion to keep going, to keep multiplying, to, to keep reproducing? Yeah. So this, this is a fun question for me. For example, um, Mark and Andy and, and Robert and Brandon and Larry and, and the crew of people um, that, that we have, been investing in each other for several years now we're we're like a brotherhood when we get together it's uh, what happens is when you have the iq and the eq together there's some sort of a bond that takes place and even though i stop discipling a group of people so that they can go disciple others they still find a way to my house and my table about once a month for a while and and so we stay relationally relationally connected you know, we have to love each other because the Bible tells us we have to love each other. But when we like each other, that's a whole nother deal. And so we become this posse of people who are about the same thing, but we all do it in our own personality, in our own context. What I do is not going to look like what you do. But when we do it together, you can smell the DNA of, of how we're taking the principles of Jesus and putting them to work. And honestly, I, I, I just want you to know that if, if we can, if we took that triangle and we said, these are the words of Jesus, these are the ways of Jesus, and these are the works of Jesus, um, what we would say in that, uh, in that IQ, EQ, LQ reality, what we're saying is that um, ultimately, it's a fuller, more robust relationship that happens with people that you spend six months with and or nine months with or a year with and then they go out to do it and you come back together for a family reunion it's it's a beautiful thing that's how we sustain each other and to be honest about every six months we now try to get all of the people who've been involved in discipleship together about every six months so that we can say hey we want to hear what god's doing over there what's the what's the break in that has broken through, that's broken out in your place? And how did it happen? Tell us about it. So we, we become a community, even though we're not in the same church or in the same states, we become a community and we learn from each other. That's fantastic. I think what you're doing by answering that one question, you're answering uh, a big scope of other questions too, because a lot of those, those questions are along the same vein. Like it's not just how do we keep this movement going and how do we instill this into other people, but how, how, how do we personally uh, change through this and, and, and influence other people? So uh, another question we have is from uh, a lady who is, is asking us as she disciples, women in her context and her, her church, and they're about to reproduce. Uh, how, how do you, as a person who has a heart for reproducing and discipleship and multiplication, but you're, you're going up against maybe some leadership, there may be a little friction there. Maybe they're more comfortable with just survival 
and addition. How do you as a member of a church who you're actively involved in, in trying to seek this and be involved in that, how do you implement or influence or encourage your leaders? Yeah. So, so one of the primary things that's important in a, in a church is for leadership to know that there's not somebody doing an end run around them. Um, and so uh, I would, I would just want to go and have a soft conversation that just says, Hey, I'm, I'm making disciples so that I can help bring more leaders into what, whatever you want them to do. And when it comes to ministry, because God's given us our leaders and Romans 13 is pretty clear that we're supposed to really submit to and be a blessing to our leaders. And so, um, first Peter three, uh, like 13 through 18 is a great passage. One of the things that I would say to you is when you see a little bit of resistance about something new, it's probably because at that church in the past, something new came in and wrecked some stuff in the past. And, and so everybody remembers the wrecks. They don't remember the fixes. And so what happens is there becomes a risk averse reality sometimes when, when anything new comes up. So um, there's two realities that you can deal with that. One, number one is just the straight up conversation. Hey, pastor or leader or uh, developer, I am for you. Um, but I, I just, my thing just happens to be making disciples and, and I love to make disciples and I'd love to see uh, an opportunity for me to make disciples and then for you to deploy them into ministry wherever they are. I, I'd love to be one of your leadership development people that, that helps this process go through. I'd love to sit down with you and show it all to you, everything that we want to do. The second thing is to just do it slow and steady. Um, you know, the, the greatest things in the world, so the, the, the first church that we implemented this at, um, for a while, it was the weird thing nobody understood, and then it became kind of, ooh, there are people who are coming out of this with stuff I don't have. And so they're not looking at which Bible study can I sign up for anymore. They're looking at how can I get what this person has. And so when we disciple people rightly, um, what happens is people start saying, hey, what, you know, what's he having? I think I'll have, I'll have some of that. You know? and, and so the reality is if you go and you work hard, uh, to disciple people, and then they begin to disciple people, um, then it, it can become a huge blessing to, to the church, but you need to make sure that your leaders are feeling fully supported by you, and, uh, and, and I know that's difficult in some places at some times, um, but I, I think if you should explain your ministry to them um, in a very cautious and, and really safe way, they, they will love the outcome. So help them love the outcome. Yeah, that that is a gracious and loving way to address that. When people start noticing the life change and the transformation and how this is helping their church, it's kind of hard to to push back against that. So uh, I, I want to kind of end this time together, Scott, with something that I think is the elephant in the room. I mean, it's obvious all of this prior to the last two months or so would would be a lot easier to understand in our culture and our context but give us a little bit of direction right now on what you're seeing in your church and in these multiplying movements and, and relationships you have give us a little bit of of information on how that's being helpful right now when people can't meet in person and gather in person and maybe even give us a little direction of what you see where we're headed in the near future with, with applying this to our churches and our ministries. So, so what's great, what, what I think has happened in this season of COVID um, is that we, we have time to do some things that we have not had time to do in the past. And we need to pay attention to the most important things. Um, I would say the first words of Jesus were pretty important. Uh, and in, in, in Mark chapter one, he said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. So I'm here and I'm available for you. Take me up on it and get all you can out of it. That's, that's a big words. The last words of Jesus, what Ken talked about yesterday, go make disciples of all nations, not just people in your backyard, but actually if you, I, we're in a military city, USA. So 
every time we disciple somebody that's in the military, we know we're deploying them to somewhere in the world. And so we have to disciple them well, and we have to do it quick because we never know when they're going to be deployed. So we take the, the most of Mark 1, 14, 15, and we take the most of Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We move those two things together to realize th these were Jesus two disciple making pieces. How do you create relationships where there's breakout to break in to break through and a break in to break through to break out? Uh, how do you how do you create that? And and the reality is for years the church has said, you know, if we only had something that was multipliable and scalable, if we only had something that would come along and give us the opportunity not to be stuck behind a desk doing admin, but to actually be in the faces of people making disciples, well, God blessed that in this season. And I, I have four huddles that we're doing on staff with people I could not ever get into huddles in the past because their job is so intense. And so uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have these huddles that we're, we're pouring into people who don't have time, but suddenly they, they have time. And what they would say, now listen to me, here's this, this is big stuff. Um, you can't do that over a screen. Uh, well, here's the reality. Right now, we can't do it without a screen because uh, we're sh shelter in place. So, so we're, we've been given a gift to be able to do this. And here's what uh, our, our executive administrative uh, leader has, has said to us. I've never had the time to sit down and do this before. And I really thought it was stupid to try to do it on a computer. But there's something about seeing everybody's faces we can actually do the IQ, the EQ, and the LQ all at the same time because I see all of your faces in the screen and they begin to actually start discipling each other. So the best discipleship huddle that we have is when I talk less and the people are starting to take it over because you know that they're gonna be really good leaders in the next generation. And so I believe that about a third of what we will do six months from now will be virtual and it makes more sense for our people watch if we program it and say hey if you can show up at four o'clock in the morning on tuesdays i will disciple you but if you can't do that i can't I, I can't make that work for you but we have we have couples that are saying as soon as my kids go to bed at eight o'clock i could i could be in a group i could be i could be in a huddle i could be being discipled and they actually prefer it you know, our, our streaming went from 14,000 people in five services uh, to 96,000 people watching online. And, and so we have something that, that's multiplying, multipliable and scalable. I think we need to receive this from Jesus as a gift, and we need to get really good at this platform and other platforms like it that will come out because the whole world is working by Zoom now. So every, every new upstart, uh, company and technology is going to have a better version of this and it's going to be a cheaper version of this and we can do it sitting in our at our table or at my desk in my office and we're not driving 30 minutes to get somewhere and driving 30 minutes back home and being two hours away from our family we're given one hour to discipleship in our home at our desk in front of our computer i i think god's given this to us as a gift is that, does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely, yes. And uh, I think what you've done so far today is not only answered some questions, you've probably created a whole list of questions for people. And as you've been talking, uh, our Disciple Making Lead team has been chatting, uh, and that's Daniel Edmonds, Robert Mullins, and Mark Ganey. And before I, I kind of let Mark close us out, I just want to mention a few things. Uh, the, the chat has been an indicator that we need more of this. So we're planning on doing more of this. Great. But what you provided for us today, Scott, has been so, so helpful, so encouraging and even challenging where we need it. So as we get ready to close our time out, I just want to say thank you for joining us and thank you for sharing with us. Uh, and we, we know that you have put a lot of thought and prayer and God has given you some great experience and some some unique gifting to be able to do this. So we really appreciate this. So as we get, get ready to pitch things to Mark, you, you want to say anything before we, yeah. we sign off, me and you sign yeah. off? 
Yeah, guys, I, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want to tell you that I, I love the state of Alabama and I love what God's doing um, from a state convention perspective. But I hope that what disciple making does is it spills outside the boundaries of Baptists and it spills outside the boundaries of what our norms are. And we actually win cities for Christ. I, I just would encourage you with this one thing. What if your, what if your mission was, could we increase the number of disciples in our city by 1% this year. Could we do that this year? Just in one, one year, could we do that? And uh, Alabama is very important and sweet to me. Uh, I spent one of the greatest years of my life in, uh, in Birmingham, uh, serving at a great church. And, uh, and that gave me a lot of these great relationships. And so these connections, you're hold, you'll hold on to for the rest of your life. These are guys that I do life with and love. So thank you all so much for your time today. Well, thank you, Scott. And now I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Mark Ganey as he closes us out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Awesome. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Hang with me for just a second because I've got some important info to give you uh, for things that you'll want down the road. But thank you again for joining us. I know you have been encouraged by, by all three of these sessions if you've joined all three. I do want to thank personally, I want to thank Scott Kendig and Daniel M and Ken Adams for joining us. And uh, I want to thank the, the, the folks, the lead team uh, that, that Andy mentioned. I want to thank Andy and Robert and Daniel and Jay Gordon also, who's been moderating our chat all throughout these sessions. So thank you guys. Uh, if you are interested in a disciple making huddle, you heard Scott talk about being poured into and somebody giving you everything they've got to disciple you. If you're interested in that, uh, email Robert at that link. And then lastly, you're going to get to hear from all three of these guys again, from Daniel M., from Scott Kendig, from Ken Adams in September. We have rescheduled our, our conference, in-person conference. You see it on the screen right there, uh, to September 28th and 29th. Uh, and you can register for free. Uh, it's aldiscipleshipconference.com, aldiscipleshipconference.com. We would love to see every one of you there and invite others. We do have a limit of 200 people, so the first 200 to register uh, will get a spot there. And Robert Coleman should be here with us as well, so we're looking forward to that. But thank you so much again for joining us uh, these two days. And I, I know that God is going to use this to continue to spread the movement of disciple-making in our state and beyond. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you in September.